we look here at Exodus 19 that uh, Pastor Brown read just a moment ago. And notice just briefly in this wonderful text that in verse 3, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, in Moses' experience, he did not have the written word. Even Genesis had not been written. There was no word. Moses went, God called. If there's anything I can document through my life, it's the fact that God has called again and again and again as I've gone to him in prayer. Tonight I'll be sharing with you the most... Uh, illuminating and helpful outline the Lord has ever given me about how this works. You shouldn't miss it. I've shared sketches of it with our 70 men last week. I've shared sketches of it with our staff. And tonight I want to share it with you. As the whole thing seemed to fall together, as I considered again the eagle's sermon, and you know I preached this, I think, the first time about 14 years ago, but I thought of the wing of prayer and the wing of praise... Obedience is the thrust that throws us out into the currents of God's Spirit. And it's there that we discover the voice. Tonight I'm going to illustrate that. You see, our soul approaches God through reason. The mind, the will, and the emotion. And there's a place for reason. There's a place for thought. There is a place for study. There is a place for experience in our lives. We are men and women whom God has given a soul. But the soul is only really one-third of the picture. We also are spirit. God has created within every one of us a capacity to either have the spirit of evil or the spirit of holiness. There's no option. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. There's no such thing as human nature where you can say that, well, as a human nature, I want to wait before I decide to have the satanic nature, the evil nature, or the God nature, the Christ nature, or the righteous nature. I want to be neutral. God says, no, sir, that reality does not exist. There is only one spirit in you, the spirit of the Father of lies or the spirit of the Christ of righteousness. And so when we get our spirit in tune, our souls are studying and trying to be obedient, but as our spirits come in tune, and how do our spirits come in tune to God? Our spirits come in tune by simply purity and radical risk. And a couple of other things, obedience, I'm going to share with you tonight. And so when your spirit is pure and risking on the wings of God's current of the spirit, and your soul has grown. And unfortunately, this is where most of us stop. We think soul is enough. When both of these things are in balance and are pleasing to God, and only He knows when the soul and the spirit, when reason and revelation come together, and that's what happens in the spirit, revelation, reason happens in the soul. When those two things come together, they meet. And we hear the voice of God. And when we hear the voice, we reign over every circumstance of life. That's why Paul in Romans 5, 17 says, Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been created to reign in life. And it's hard to get there. It's not easy. But that is the thrust and the purpose of the Christian life. You see, your, your praise and prayer, both of those things, if you are praying, that shows your soul is inclined toward health. If you're praising, it shows your spirit is inclined toward health. The real checks on the condition of your spiritual life, on whether you can be trusted or handle responsibility, or move forward in life is the check of prayer and praise. Are you praying? Then your soul is being held in check by the Father. Are you praising? Then your spirit is set on the things of God, and I know that you're probably listening to Him. But if you're not praying, your soul is bound to be deceived. If you're not praising, it shows that you have been seduced by the spirits of the age, and you're dangerous to be around. But if your prayer and your praising are in evidence, then 
the voice of God can come to you, and you will not do me damage. Now, in Exodus 19, we look at that. Moses went up to the Lord, and the Lord called to him. Notice in verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's the point, to bring you to myself. It's never our work for the cause of God. It's our work from our love of the Master that motivates us and thrills us. There's not enough strength in you. There's not enough fortitude in you. There's not enough will in you. There's not enough power in you to keep you going and protect you from exhaustion in this world. The only thing that will drive us to finish well is a personal intimacy with Jesus Christ. I carried you on eagle's wings. What a beautiful picture of the eagle there. The mother eagle, when she's teaching the little eaglet to fly, uh, carries him on her back and uh, lets him fall off. And uh, you can see how that happens so often in our lives, how uh, uh, the little eaglet begins to fall and flutters those little wings, and, oh, he doesn't know whether they're going to work or not, and sometimes they don't. And yet, just before the little eaglet hits the ground, the mother swoops down and catches him and bears him back up again. In fact, that's why uh, the Scripture says that as she stirs the nest, some of these eagle verses, an eagle will come and stir up the nest and push her little eaglet out, and he'll begin to fall, and he, she'll watch, and uh, he'll try those little wings, and, well, it's not enough. She'll swoop down and pick him up and carry him up for another try. And this is what the Lord does to you and to me. Any one of us, given our own soul apart from the Spirit, would say, I'm content with my life. I'm not going to take any risk. I'm going to stay right here and protect myself. I'm not going to throw myself in trustworthiness on the mercy of God. I'm going to plan my own little life and bring it together. But have you noticed, no matter how much the paycheck comes, no matter how much the house is secure, no matter how much retirement is taken care of, no matter how much the promotion comes, no matter what you do or where you are, whatever situation you have finally created for yourself where you think that you can be safe, or the other term from it is idolatrous, the Lord Jesus comes in and shakes your little world. Now, we voted a minute ago how many of you have walked in the valley, how many of you have had your little world shaken by the Father again and again and again and again. A little poem I picked up that's so beautiful at this point. The mother eagle stirs the nest to make her fledglings fly, but watches each with outstretched and fierce maternal eye, with wings outstretched and fierce maternal eye, and swoops if any fails to soar and lands them in the nest once more. How many times has the Lord pushed me out? Woo! Just before I knew I was going to hit bottom. Woo! She's there to bring me back again. There have been times in my life when I have felt that the pressures, the situation, the struggles were so great, I had failed so miserably that I could not go on. Am I the only one? And then his wings would come and lift me again. There's so much to learn about the Christ life here. I hope, my dear friend, that every one of you has a relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope you're not sitting here Sunday after Sunday being members of this church for years, and you've never really touched the Holy Spirit. Oh, you think you're a Christian. You believe the fact. You believe the, the gospel formula. You believe Jesus was God. He died for our sins. The Word of God is true. But it's all soul. It's all in your mind. It's all in your will. You're here today by emotion, and you've never touched the Spirit, see. I plead with you to examine your heart. John says, test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Well, Paul said that. John also said, test the spirits, though. Test, test. Ask yourself, if Jesus Christ is not the most exciting thing to you on earth, then the number one question in your life and mine is, why not? 
Why not? Do you dare think, lift your voice, or show by your actions that even though you dare take the name to yourself as Christian, there is something here far more exciting to occupy your time, and dominate your thoughts, and take your energies than the Lord Jesus Christ? Hmm. It's a good question to answer, to test ourselves about where we are. So as we look again, prayer and praise. Now then, let's look at uh, the next thing I want to share with you. Open your outlines, if you would, and you'll see there <clears throat> that something we sh I shared last Sunday night, and this is uh, what you missed. I talked about it some if you were not here, but I have a little outline lifted on eagle's wings. Is that, uh, that's in there, isn't it, Pastor Brown? Where did I find it? Here, it's in there, good. I'm, uh, yeah, here we go on the back, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Here are your battles. Now, you say, well, is the self, is the self not my greatest battle? You have self rather small at the bottom, Satan big at the top. What I'm saying there isn't that your self is not as big a battle as other things. What I'm saying is it's the one you're first most aware of. What am I going to do? Paul said in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man that I am. And so you have yourself to take care of. Ephesians 5, love your, uh, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now, boy, there's a heavy one for you. Siblings, your children. Ephesians 6, don't provoke your children. Raise them in the nurture of the Lord. Nehemiah 4, fight for your little ones. How does a man fight and raise his children in the nurture of the Lord? Easy to say. Impossible to do without hearing the voice of God. The staff. <clears throat> now, you say, well, wait, I don't have a staff. Yes, you do. Everyone has a staff, and the staff really are those people around him that are most necessary to make his life work or to cause his life to fail. You have your friends. You have your family. You have your relatives. You have uh, uh, people in the church, and all that. Everyone has a staff around them. In fact, the Lord Jesus here in this passage said he called them to be with him. And until we really get an honest check on who we are in relationship to the people we know the closest, will always be skewed to blindness. The saints, what a battle that is. Forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. We're to forgive all the Christians as, as Christ has forgiven us. That's not easy. There has to be first an understanding of how much Christ has forgiven you. And let me stop here just a minute and share this great principle with you. You see, if we're to be like Jesus Christ, there's only one way to do it. You can't hear about it. You can't study about it. You have to do it. That's why he said, don't just hear me, don't agree with me, follow me. That's why you say, oh, the church talks so much about money. I think if there's one attribute of the Lord God that stands out in utter, absolute clarity, it's the fact that we have a giving God. How can you or I ever hope to understand God without being giving people. We look at the quarterback there behind the ball and say, oh, anyone can do that. No, no, you have to be a quarterback to really understand all the pressures that come upon you. You say, well, anyone can mother children. No, you have to be a mother and begin to understand. A mother who's mothered three has deeper appreciation for a mother mothering four. A mother mothering two has great appreciation for a mother mothering three. See, the only way we understand God is to follow God in what he has done. And if you can't follow him with your cheap change, with your bills, I think, how on earth are you going to follow in the deeper things of life? That's why money is so critical. Why some of you right now, you've cheated the church. You think, well, I haven't given the church what they needed and all the rest and what I should have, but I've gotten by with it. No, you haven't. No one ever gets by with anything that they do in disobedience to the Father. None of us do. God's time schedule is a little bit different than ours, but he'll be on time. He's adequately able. And the person to say, I have not given, therefore I have saved, that's totally wrong. I have not given, therefore I have not understood God. Therefore, by not understanding God, I have not lived. I have not nourished my soul. 
You nourish your soul by doing the things the Father wants you to do. You take responsibility. The Lord Jesus said, I am among you as a servant. Some of you have no responsibilities apart from those you choose. Take a responsibility for God's church. See, every one of us in here to grow in Christ has to take a responsibility for his church because that's what he did. If you're not going to do what Christ did, how on earth do you hope to understand Christ and in understanding Christ reign in life? It's so simple. But Satan has blinded us, see. Be great givers, time, talent, treasure, truth. Be great lovers, forgive as Christ has loved and forgiven you. Be great servants, I am among you as a servant. I lay down my life for the sheep. Most of us are so myopic and have shutters on our eyes that we cannot see these great truths. The, saint, the sinners, Hebrews 12, the Lord Jesus uh, uh, considered the hostility against himself. Contradiction of sinners. Jesus faced hostility. We're going to face it more and more in this world we live in, and we'll talk about that tonight as we talk about the uh, Rutherford Institute and some of the things that are facing our nation. And then Satan, like a lion, he's trying to destroy us. He lies, 1 Peter 5, 8, seeing who he may devour. Satan's gnawing on some of us here now, big time, and we don't know it. That's why some of our prayers should be, Lord, reveal to me the strongholds in my life that are keeping me from being free to follow and love you. And then uh, there's my e eagle illustration again. I commit these verses to you. I can only refer to them. I hope you'll study them and look at them. The uh, verse on the right up there under praise, Galatians 6, 7, be not weary in well-doing. All right, let's take the other here, the key characteristics of the eagle. <clears throat> and uh, there I could have listed about 10 more, <clears throat> but uh, I have here only 16. Let's just look at about four of those. Number one, when the wind is especially favorable, eagles are believed to be able to carry weight as much as their own. Only by living on the currents of the Holy Spirit can we carry supernatural burdens. See, raising your child is a supernatural problem. There are laws of nature and there are laws of supernature, and we have to comply with them both. And once we get into the stream of the Spirit, we're able to hold up under the crushing burdens that we try to resist in the soul. We never can do it. Number three, eagles' nests are built high, usually, sometimes in the cliffs. They add material every year. Old ones are 10 to 20 feet wide, a little thought there. Time coupled with high ambition broadens the influence of our lives. I challenge you to think high for your life. Lord, give me an ambition. Give me a vision. Give me a dream for you. High godly living means, now notice the three benefits of living like an eagle. Number one, they're safety. Number two, they're soaring. Number three, they're surveying. You see, the higher we get caught up in the truth of God, the safer we are from the lies of the earth. The more we taste the wonder of knowing Jesus Christ, how wonderful he is. If someone were to come and say, H.D., tell me, where have you and the congregation at University Baptist Church missed it the most? One of the things I would say, we have not appreciated the wonder of Jesus Christ. The seeing. Oh, in all that he is. Soar, you see. And then there's surveying. That's the idea to see everything from God's point of view. What a difference it makes. The Lord Jesus said, I must always be about my Father's business. I do only that which the Father has told me to do. The Lord Jesus had surveying eyes. He saw heaven as it was and the world that it should be and made the proper relationships. Number six, when the eagle soars, the feathers spread out like fingers and bend up at the tip due to pressure. Last Sunday night, I shared with you an airplane flies not by pressure from below, but the lack of pressure from above. It's the way an eagle's wings are made, the way an airplane's wings are made. It's called camber. And I'm going to illustrate that again tonight, how we fly out of our problems from being a problem-oriented per person to being a 
promise or an uh, orinated person. Your orientation ought to be to God's promises, not to earth's problems. Most of you are dominated. Most of us are too often dominated by problems, not by promises. And now even when the eagle soars, some of us think, oh, if I could just soar like an eagle, that means I would be cut free from all the problems of earth. No, no, no. Even as the eagle soars, there's still tension and pressure on the wings. Eh? You've got to maintain that. But even in the currents of the Spirit, there's pressure. I don't think there was ever a man on earth whose wings were more spread in praise and prayer to the Father as the Lord Jesus as he was carried to the cross. If there was ever a time that Christ flew, it was as he was carried to the cross and hung there, see. The Christian life of praise and prayer is not an escape from the fallen realities of this earth. Number 11, eagles have incredible eyesight and can see small prey from two miles up. They have double eyeballs and eyelids. I uh, read everything I can. It's amazing how little uh, books talk about this. And I say, oh, here's an article on the eagle, and I'll read it, but it didn't even mention it. What's going on here? But what this speaks of, the Lord says, you shall be like an eagle, you shall mount up like an eagle. We're to have the characteristics of an eagle in our Christian life. Eagles see, notice my comment there, they see the strategic large and the tactical small issues. Most of us live our lives on tactical issues. Those of us in the military know that there are strategic objectives and there are tactical objectives. There are little things you need to take care of to keep the place running, but there are big things you need to do to be sure you're ready when the time comes. And the eagle has the double vision. The Christian has double vision to see both earth and eternity. Last week after the message, uh, Dr. Terry Levy, one of our professors at the university, came up to me and said, well, after the sermon today, I understand now what I saw in Alaska. And he told me the, the story of being out in Alaska on a fishing boat, and he wanted to see some eagles before he left, and he asked the guide and the captain, are there any eagles? They looked and looked and looked, even had binoculars. They could see there wasn't an eagle in the air anywhere. And the captain said, well, there's none there. I'm sorry. And so they took the old fish that they did not need, threw them into the water. And Terry told me, he said, H, this is just last week, you know, in a matter of just seconds, not one or two, but... 20, 15, something like that. In a matter of seconds, a huge, beautiful eagle struck that fish in the water and carried it away. And I had a little blessing right back there at the back of the left door last week. Oh, Lord. Again, you've confirmed to me the truth of your word through the testimony of one of my brothers in Christ. Because from two miles up, the eagle can spot. You can't see it, but just like you can't see heaven, but he's there. And that eagle spots it in several places in the Scripture. I don't have them listed here. Well, uh, we're told again and again that the enemy shall come upon you. Their horses shall have the swiftness of the eagle. Isn't that beautiful? And the eagle sees his target and ha! In a matter of seconds, it's gone. The double eyes. Number 15, young eagles leave their nest at three months. They must learn the lessons of the wings, the currents, and the realities of nature. The mother eagle carries him. We've talked about that. Now, what are the things we need to learn? The truth of the wings. Well, that's prayer and praise. H, you don't have wings. You can't fly, son, unless prayer and praise are dominant themes in your life. I don't care what's going on in your life right now. I don't care how bad it is. Have you praised him for it? And I don't care how impossible the way seems and how empty your prayer life is and how you feel you're just a novice and a first grader at prayer. Have you prayed about it? Doesn't make any difference. Pray, you see. And that's the first lesson. Pray, praise. Oh, Lord, what are you showing me? And the second thing is that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, see, that's the reality of nature and the reality of the supernature. There are two worlds out there. You know that. In fact, as John Whitehead and I were speaking last week, he made one statement. I jotted it down. It was tremendous. Here's a man who knows American culture. Both of his boys, or two of his boys at least, are sitting back there right now. I said hello to him this morning. There are students here at the U of A. Uh, Josh, 
love you guys, you know that. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, but as John and I were talking, he said, there's one thing for sure about the teenage world and the youth world in America today and most of our adults, they are burnt out on materialism. They're sick of it. They're through with it. They know it's not enough. And that's why in America today, there's such a tremendous turning to the transcendent. That's why the New Age movement is capturing thousands of minds. That's why in the Christian church today, there is a lie, there is a heresy. They call, we call it the faith movement. It's a lie. It's not true. It's faith in faith. And some of these guys you watch on TV, you should turn off because they're not really centered in the person of Christ. And he says everywhere there's a tremendous turning to the transcendence. See, the biggest problem in America today, friend, is not secular humanism. We blast that again and again and again. These secular humanists, they're destroying the church and all this, the feminist agenda, the Beijing conference and all that stuff, the, uh, the radical gender revisionist. But let me tell you what the biggest problem in America is today. It's not secular humanist, it's secular Christianity. How dare we hold the humanists responsible for a response to a God they don't know? How we'd better hold ourselves responsible as Christians to the God we do know. See? And that's why until we break here as a church with the secular powers that overcome us and begin to hear the voice of God and all the thousands of voices that are out there, what are we to do but hear the voice of God?